is the truth? Where do we find the truth? In the word of God. That's where we find out what truth is. This is where we find out if our theology lines up with God's truth. Uh, Has there ever been a time where when you were drinking water, it was especially refreshing? Can you think of a time when that happened? Anyone? Nope, none of you. Any of you thirsty right now? Because I'll throw bottles out at you. Anybody want to? Anybody want a bottle of water? Oh, I see a hand raised. I've got a bunch here. I don't want to drink them all. Can Can you catch? Oh, <laughs> don't worry. That was on camera. Anybody else want a water? Oh, there's all of a sudden a lot of people want water. It's like, oh, you take one, go for it. Have Have fun. Enjoy the water. I I didn't even open this one, right? I drank from a different one. I somewhat promise. I'll try to get one over there, but. Maybe you could send somebody who wanted a water over here. Water is something that's incredibly important to our lives, isn't it? I mean, I don't know if you know this, but the the average male in the world, their body is made up of 45 to 60 percent water, and the average female, it's 40 to 55 percent. So, so congratulations, men. Let's hear it for us for carrying more water weight than the women of the world. And it's it's good to know that we're finally good at something, right? And, and 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 I remember one time when I was in high school, so it was, it was my senior year, school hadn't started yet, but uh, but the football team chose me to be the captain. And so all of a sudden, I was really, really concerned or interested in making sure that I was leading in a way that showed myself to be incredibly tough, incredibly awesome. And it was a super hot day. We were doing two-a-days, where, uh, which means that you got up really early in the morning, and you, you did a workout with the team, and then you later on in the day, you... Uh, would go back in the heat of the day. You want one? I've got two left. Let's, yeah, I'll take one, whatever. That's what they're saying. You're excited. I'm so glad you're excited. We had two a days and I was trying to, I was trying to impress the teammates, trying to let them know that we can, we can do this. We can be tough. We can be strong. Right. And so, so I remember on a super hot day, I'm just going to leave the last two up here. If at a point you get super thirsty because of what I'm doing. Oh, the rest of you, you're out of luck unless you want to drink this slightly used one for five dollars, going once. No, and so, so at the uh, uh, during the afternoon workout, we're all going through this stuff, and it's super hot out, and and everyone is trying to uh, to work through this stuff. And, and the coaches, they were smart; they had water containers all over the place, right? But but we're talking this is the mid '80s, and we didn't know that water was super super important to athletes or they could actually die, right? And so I'm fighting through everything, and we'd stop for water breaks, and I'm telling everybody, guys, we don't need water breaks. We got to be tough. We got to be strong. And, and and later on in the afternoon workout, I, I'm I'm focusing so hard on being tough and strong that the next thing I know, I start to get incredibly dizzy. And I pass out right in front of everybody. I pass out. And, and so the next thing that I remember is, is there's some football players who have lifted me up and they're carrying me off the practice field so that they can continue practice while the tough guy lays on the side and tries to recover. And, 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 the, and one of the coaches comes and he sits down by me and he asks the question, Hey, uh, Justin, how much water have you had since we've been out here? And I'm kind of dizzy, right? And things are coming into view. And I said, well, none. And, uh, and he called me an idiot and, and told me that, uh, that once I get better, I am going to be doing push-ups to show people how tough I am um, for the rest of the time because I was teaching them a wrong way uh, of, of what was important and what wasn't important. And, and what was important was this water. As, as many of you know, we need water in our lives. As a matter of fact, what, what studies will sh- say is that each and every day we need at least a half a gallon of water. Now, you could hear studies that tell you more, but we need at least a half a gallon of water in order to keep the balance that we need, in order to make sure that our joints and, and, and our tissues that, and our spinal cord, that all of these things have the things that they need. And, and when we start, uh, when we don't get enough water in our bodies, what begins to happen, right? We start to dehydrate. And, and when we dehydrate, what are some of the symptoms that we experience, right? Dizziness, fatigue, right? Muscle cramps. These are the things that begin to happen to us if we don't have water. I mean, I mean, think about it. Our bodies can go several weeks without food. Some of our bodies could probably go a little longer, right? But we can only go three or four days without water. 
we need water. And some of you are already are beginning to see where I'm heading with this, right? But sometimes in life, and for some of us, maybe it's been much of our lives, we find ourselves spiritually dehydrated. And what does spiritual dehydration look like? Right? If, if we're not getting the things that we need spiritually each and every day in our lives, what begins to happen? What I think is, is irritability, right? A, a lack of focus on, on what we know is right. We just get caught up in doing other things. Some of us, we, we actually, uh, anger begins to increase in our lives as well. The way that we treat others is typically different when we haven't nourished ourselves spiritually. Have you noticed that about yourself? Because I see it in my life when it happens. And so what do we do? What do we do with those people that understand that, that our lives need to be spiritually rehydrated just like our bodies need to be spiritually or physically rehydrated with water? That there is something that ought to happen each and every day in our lives in order to make sure that we are getting what we need for the day, just like that half a gallon of water would do. Well, the series that, that we are working in right now is called Simplicity. And, and the idea about this is, is, is just trying to, to help us just narrow everything down as best we can, especially during this time where we're, where we're heading up to Easter. Where, where we can stop being distracted by this, all the stuff around it. And what are the key things that we can focus on during this time leading up to celebrating the resurrection of Christ? And last week we talked about how, how we, the followers of Jesus, are the people that choose to live a centered life, one that is centered in Christ. What we say, what we admit is, is that Jesus is the most important thing to us. And we're not going to let anything else get in the way. We're not going to be distracted by worry and frustration and those things. And when we are, we remind ourselves that Jesus is the most important thing in life. This week, what I want to talk about is, is what are we going to do each and every day to help our lives just simply be ones that are lived for him? What, what is it going to be our daily pursuit the passage that we are heading to today in Philippians chapter 4. Um, and, and for the women who are doing the study on Philippians right now, uh, I know that you're about to head into this area, so I'm probably going to give you a bunch of answers. Or later, after we're all done, you can give me a bunch of answers on what's actually right, okay? But, but where we're heading today, the Apostle Paul is writing this letter to, to this people at the Church of Philippi. And, and while he's doing it, once again, he's in prison, right? And he's, he's this guy who has struggled uh, with many times being in prison because he was trying to unashamedly live the life of Christ and share Jesus with everyone that he came in contact with. So once again, he's in prison. He's writing this letter to the, to the Philippians, and he's just trying to encourage them and help them in, 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 in their living the, their life for Christ. And, and if we were to give some general ideas of what the, the chapters were before, you know, after Paul does his thanksgiving, he, he just reminds people that, that Christ chose to live this life of humility and that that is who we are to imitate with our lives. And then he follows that up to say that means that we are the people who are walking humbly with God in the world around us. And then fast forwarding, we get to this chapter where Paul talks about stuff that I believe he's inviting us to focus on each and every day of our lives. That this becomes our daily pursuit and Lord, as we, as we begin to look at what your word says, as I ask God each and every week, and may it be a prayer that never ends for this church and for our lives, open our eyes and our hearts to know you more, to somehow, some way, experience the power and the presence of God in our lives through your word. God, that, that there would be people here that are, that are wondering if you're even real. That somehow, God, you touch their lives in a way that only you can. And those of us that are trying to figure out what it means to live for you, God, and daily, may your word show us the truth today. 
God, that we would be a people that choose to daily (laughs) rehydrate our souls with the things of Jesus and the things that your word says today. So may the things that I say, God, and the things that we all hear be acceptable and pleasing to you. For you are our rock and our blessed redeemer. Amen. And so Paul, after he talks about that we are the ones who walk this life in humility, he begins to talk about some stuff that I believe he's inviting us to consider and, and, and have as a part of our lives each and every day. And and starting in verse 4 of chapter 4, he starts by saying, Rejoice in the Lord always. And I will say it again, rejoice. Now, when we think of the word rejoice, what do we think of? Oftentimes, I think people think somebody who is super happy, maybe even obnoxiously happy. Some of you know those obnoxiously happy people, right? And yeah, it's not that you can't get enough of them, but you hope that you don't have to get enough of them, you know, because they're just always seeing the bright side of everything. Right? But, but, but here's what typically happens with a lot of people in this world. When we think of the word rejoice or we think of the word joy, we tie it to the circumstances of our life. So, so, so you're Tom, okay? And, and if you're Tom actually here, well, then this should be easier for you, right? But if you're Tom and, and you wake up and you, and you, you, you check online to, just to see how, how the scores went at the football game, although it's not football season, but at the football game that, that happened on, on the weekend and, and, and things, everything aligned. And the next thing you know, your fantasy team won and you are finally in first place and the rest of the people they could just have it because now I'm in first place right and you're super excited about it because your team is in first place and and so you head out because you have to go to work right and and so you head out to your car which you parked out on the street last night because of something that was going on in your driveway and you see that the bumper is cracked At some point in the night, somebody hits your car. And and now that the bumper is cracked, you realize, I haven't even made a single payment on this thing. And now I'm going to have to pay to get it fixed. And you're super frustrated that this happened. And now you're driving to work and you're fuming mad because, because of what somebody did. And they didn't stop to let you know that it happened. And you get into work, the boss calls you into the office. And that's never a good sign, is it? Except for today, when he says, you have done, Tom, you have done such a fantastic job. Your numbers are super stellar. I just want to let you know that we are going to give you a year-end bonus of $3,000. And you are pumped. You're super excited. Yes! That is awesome. And you can't wait to go home and tell your wife this good news. And so you're working through the day and and you're just super excited thinking about what's going to happen when you get home. And you go home and you get there and you swing in the door. and It's like, honey, guess what? And she's got that look on her face, right? Like, it doesn't matter how good your news is. It's not going to be quite as bad as the news I'm about to share you with you. He says, well, just, we got a $3,000 bonus. And she said, that is going to work out so well because the hot water tank stopped working today. And the next thing you know, the, the excitement that you have goes back down in the gutter. It's like, ah, oh, why does this stuff keep happening to me? And when we see a, just a story like that, just an example of what happens in people's lives, when we think of rejoice, we think of those high moments, right? And we certainly don't think of rejoice in those low moments. So what is Paul really talking about here when he says, rejoice in the Lord always? We need to understand what rejoice means. Right? And, and the, the word rejoice in the Greek, it actually means a happy calm. Okay? So, so you're, you're happy about what's going on, but you're not obnoxious about it. So, I mean, this is just the image of what they're saying rejoice is. A happy calm because you realize that you are well off. Let that sink in. A guy in prison is telling people to rejoice. To be okay because you're well off. Paul's saying, I'm well off. We don't often think that we're well off. We often think that we could have more. Things could be better. Paul says, no, we are well off people. He, and he actually says, I will say it again. Rejoice. You're well off. 
Now, if you've been here the last few years, I, I, I say this uh, each and every time it happens in Scripture. When something's repeated, we ought to take notice. This time, Paul actually reminds us, lets us know, I'm repeating this because I want you to know this is a big deal. That you rejoice. That you realize that things are good. You're well off. Whatever situation you find yourself in, you are well off. How in the world could he say that? Well, for followers of Jesus, I think we know the answer. Sometimes we need to be reminded of it, but I think we we know the answer. It's because God is still on the throne. Because of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, we can be in a relationship with God. Everything is going to work out in the end. So remember, we're well off. You're well off, and I'm well off. And then, and then he goes on to say, and let your gentleness be evident to all. Now, the, the, he, the Greek word, I'm sorry, the, the Greek word for gentleness here, um, there's no easy translation into the English. And, and so it's talking about the way that we treat people, right? It's talking about this gracious gentleness that we have um, when we are in contact with other people. But then he says, let that graciousness, this kindness, this gentleness that you have that for other, that you're going to show to other people, it says, let it be evident to all. And there's this very, there's this significant contrast between the word rejoice and the word evident, how that's to be evident. The word rejoice, it's this active, passive, present verb where, where right now with whatever has been going on in our life, whatever's going on right now in our life, we can pause and remind ourselves that we're well off. We are okay. But now, because of that, we can behave in such a way that other people experience some graciousness and gentleness. Let that be evident to all. And the word evident is a, is a very, very passive word. And, and what the idea here is, is that the people that are seeing and experiencing the evidence of your rejoicing and your gentleness and graciousness don't have to do a single thing. The way that we treat other people is just who we are. We don't wait for somebody to be kind to us. We don't wait for something good to happen. They shouldn't have to do anything in order to experience the graciousness, the gentleness that we have in our lives because, if we can be honest, we're well off. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Paul says, and on the other hand, if you didn't catch it yet, rejoice. And just let people know that God's been good to you. They do not have to do anything in order to experience that. And then he says, the Lord is near. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean that the Lord is near? And how does that tie in to, to what was just said? Well, when we think of near, what do we think of? That there's this closeness that we have with somebody. But let's be honest. You can be near somebody and have no connection with them at all, right? So, so uh, Car and I, we were, we were on an airplane just, uh, just the, the, this past month. And, and here's what I do when I'm on an airplane, right? I try to set myself up. If, if my wife isn't willing to be the buffer in the three seats, right? Um, th then what I try to do is I try to set myself up where everyone around me knows that I want nothing to do with them. <laughs> Right? And so, and, and a lot of us do this, right? And so we get on the plane and what's the first thing we do? Many of us will put on earphones, right? Or we'll open a book or we'll, we'll start busy working or we'll grab something. We'll start watching something. And there could be somebody sitting right next to us inside our personal bubble, which some of us, the personal bubble is like four feet, right? Well, mine's like 10, right? This whole six foot thing because of the pandemic, score for people like me. But now we're sitting right next to somebody and they could be that close to me and I know nothing about them and I experience nothing about them and th as they with me. So nearness doesn't necessarily mean that there is this closeness that takes place except with Christ. Because what we know about Jesus, right, is, is he has done the work that God wanted to have done for us by dying on the cross and raising again. 
And he is now actively working in our lives, even if we are shutting everything out and just trying to focus on me and not let anyone else bother me. Jesus is there. He's working, but he is also waiting for us to be the type of people that will pause and say, you know what? Things are well off. Things are good. I mean, I I don't think about it and I don't realize it a whole lot, but things are okay. And we start being a blessing to other people and we allow Christ into our lives to make a difference. What Paul tells us to do, the Church of Philippi to do, is to begin, and maybe begin each and every day with praise. With just remembering that because of Christ, we're well off. And allow that to begin to impact the things that go on beyond our bubble, our circle. Because the Lord's near and the Lord wants to connect in with us to help us to do all the things that he wants for our lives in this world. So, so rejoice. I say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. They do not have to do something in order to expect it from us. We just choose to be the kind, gracious uh, people that God invites us to be, right? Because the Lord is near. But then he goes on to say, and, and, and do not be anxious uh, about anything. Now, the word anxious here, if you think about it, it, it literally means distracted. Now, when we are anxious about something, when we begin to worry about something, what happens to us? We lose focus on a lot of other things that are going on in life and begin to hone in on this specific thing. And and so what Paul is reminding us is is that we are not to be distracted uh, by anything, anything in this world outside of the fact that we're well off. Because of what Christ has done and is doing in our lives, we're okay. And the gentleness that we share with others so that they can experience God's love through us, regardless of what they do for us. Don't be distracted about anything. But if there are things in your life that that you tend to worry about, that you tend to be concerned about, that do distract you in every situation, which literally means there is nothing too small, there is nothing too little for you to bring to God. And so it says, in every situation, nothing too little or too small, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. Prayer means that we're having this conversation with God, which I get that for some of us, myself included, you know, it's easy for us to talk to God. It's hard for us to listen to God. And and because we think, well, I don't know if he's saying anything, which which I get, but that's the benefit of also having God's word to help us to understand things. And, And this becomes a part of our life daily. By prayer and petition. Petition means that we can take these things, no matter how small they are, and bring them to God again and again and again. We do not have to worry about bugging God with the things that that tend to distract us and worry us. Just bring them to God again and again with prayer, petition, and with thanksgiving. Well, let let me ask you a question. Have you ever seen an ungrateful child. Please don't tell me it's mine. Please don't tell me it's mine. Have you ever seen an ungrateful child? You know, a kid who never learned to say thank you. You do something nice or you give them a gift and they just take it and they open it and then they move on or they go play with it and they never say those words. Kids, if you're here, say thank you when your parents do things. When your parents bless you with something, when your parents give you consequences, it might seem weird at the time, but say thank you. You'll understand all this at some point in life. What happens to the ungrateful child when they grow up? We grow up expecting things from this world. We grow up assuming that we deserve things, and if we don't get the things that we want, what we do as ungrateful adults is we become irritated. We, we become frustrated with the world around us. Or, or, or for some of us, we've gone to God and God has not given us the things that I wanted or I thought that I needed. And we become frustrated and irritated with God. And we say, well, then forget it. Forget so-and-so. I borrowed him my, my drill. And he never reciprocated 
Forget him. I'm not going to help him ever again. I asked God to help us to deal with this thing, and it didn't seem to turn out the way that I wanted. Forget God. I think this is why Paul is trying to remind us that we ought to be people that go before God and we can go again and again and again, but with a thankful heart. How in the world can we do that with a thankful heart? Well, remember that we remember that we're well off. God gives us everything that we need in order to make it through the day. And so by with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, go ahead, he says, present your requests to God. Talk with God. Let him know the concerns and the frustrations that you have so, so that you can hopefully begin to let go of these things and remember that we are well off. And as we do that, and as, as that begins to take place where we're going to God with, with the stuff of our life, it says, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. Well, the word peace is something that I've tried to do, uh, 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 you know, uh, some explaining uh, to us in the past here. Where, where what I've talked about is, is the, the Hebrew sense of peace is not the way that we hear it, where it's just quiet and calm. But, but the idea of peace is, is that my relationship with God, is all right. That's what Hebrew peace meant. Me and God, we're okay with how things are going with one another. Some other people have, have, have tried to describe peace, uh, you, you know, just using these word pictures, like imagine a little tiny chirping bird sitting in the nest uh, of a large tree, and it's just chirping away and chirping away. And, and the winds start blowing, and the, and the branches start moving, and you actually hear the creaking and the cracking of the tree, but the chirping bird just continues to chirp because it knows that it's not in danger. Somebody else has described peace as imagine that a, a well has been dug super deep in the midst of a beautiful meadow and, and it's reaching the water and it's fresh and clear and pure water, right? And, and no matter what goes on around that well, right? You could have two armies who are battling and killing each other around the well. It does not affect the sweet, cold water inside the well. And we start to get a picture of when, what Paul is saying is, and the peace of God, regardless of what is going on around us, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, which is superior to any of the things that I can grasp. It's like the well, but more. It's like the bird being okay, regardless of the craziness going around. I know that I'm okay in my relationship with God. He's okay with me. He's okay with me going to him with the worries and the frustrations and the concerns I have. And when I do, I seek to let go and just live this life of being gracious and generous to the people around me. I don't get it. I don't fully understand this type of peace that transcends all our understanding. It says that peace of God, from God, guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. Now, the, the word guard here, it, it's, it's the image of a, of a soldier, right, protecting uh, something. I mean, so you have that idea, right? But it also is the image of a soldier looking at the thing it's protecting. And so it's a picture of both. Keeping an eye on us and keeping an eye on all the things going on around us. That's the type of peace that God is trying to offer to people when he encourages us to pray and replace our anxiety, our distractions with the peace of God. We can go before him, share what's going on, and trust him with our lives and maybe even begin to let go of those things as we trust his peace. So, so then if, if I do this, if I spend some time with God and, and I share with him my concerns, and then if we were to imagine, I say my amen, right? And now I'm moving on with the rest of my day. What does that look like? If this is a daily pursuit, what does that look like? Paul answers that question. 
when he says, so finally, as he's nearing the end of his letter, he says, finally, brothers and sisters, all of us who are, who are willing to, 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 to live for Jesus, he says, whatever is, and then he creates, he starts with this list, and each of these things mean something, but I'm just going to highlight a couple of them. And the first one is true, right? Whatever is true, because the, because the Greek means whatever is in fact true, right? It, it's not whatever we think is true, whatever we think is good, whatever we think is right. What, what, what Paul is saying is, is there is truth. And whatever is in fact true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable. Whatever is in fact truly these things, not what we think, but what God thinks. He said, if there is anything excellent or praiseworthy, and again, what the Greek says is the word here for excellent or leading up to it is morally excellent or praiseworthy. So, so whatever is in fact true and right and, and noble and pure and lovely and admirable, whatever is morally excellent and praiseworthy, these are the things that I want you to think on. And the word think here means conclude. This is the conclusion of what we think. It's not we consider it and we decide, but God has made it. Thus, we conclude that that's how we live. And for some of us, this means that we have to change the way that we think, right? A man who is going through financial collapse, he, he goes to meet with his pastor, and he's just trying to seek some counseling, and he starts sharing with the pastor everything that's going on and how everything just seems to be falling apart in his world because, because all the financial stuff that he had planned, it's just all falling apart, right? Right? And the pastor says to him, he says, oh, I am so sorry that you have lost your faith. And the guy looks at him and says, no, I, I, I haven't lost my faith. I, it's, it's this financial stuff. And the pastor says, oh, oh, well, I, I, I am so sorry that, that you've lost any trust in God that you have. And the guy's going, no, this is, has nothing to do with whether or not I'm trusting God. And the pastor says, oh, I, I am so sorry that you've lost your salvation. And the guy goes, I haven't lost my salvation. And the pastor says to him, well, if you still have your faith, your trust in God, and your salvation, it seems to me you might be focusing on the wrong things. And I think that's what Paul is trying to help people to see, that he's writing this letter. These are the things we conclude are important in our lives, the things that are in fact true, and that we choose to do what is morally excellent and worthy of praise to God. And he goes on to say, so, so whatever you've learned, Paul says, whatever you've learned or received or heard from me, and then he even says, or seen in me, which I think is a bold, bold statement, right? Well, what Paul is saying is, is I'm doing my best as, be, you know, as best I can to live for Jesus, and I've done that before you, and, and I'm still doing that for my, and, you know, you know in the, in what's going on in my life. And, and so, so anything that you've heard, that I've taught you, that I'm te- trying to teach you now, or even the way that you've seen me live my life, God puts godly examples in our lives all around us. And sometimes we have to pause and take a look to see who they are, where they are, and what they are doing heard or seen in me, put into practice. And, and the word practice here means bring to completion, right? So it's not just, so try it. Eh, if it doesn't work, just go do something else. No, it works. It means that we put this into practice until it becomes complete in our lives. It, it, it's like the, the 1967, I believe it was, uh, American Breed song. Do you guys know who the group American Breed is? What? One hit wonder like that, bend me, shape me any way you want me, right? Right? As long as you love me, it's all right. It's okay. I mean, and that's, that's the idea of what Paul is saying, is that we have to be the people. Our daily pursuit is to let God choose to bend us and shape us any way he wants to. And, and as long as God loves us, now, of course, the, the, the band is talking about girls, right? But, but, but what we see is, is as long as God loves us, and is with us and is near and is ready to engage in as much as we allow him to, it's going to be okay, which is how it ends. He says, and the God of peace, remember the relationship, 
even in the midst of the craziness of the world that goes on around us. The God of peace, who was near those of us who are choosing now to live the life that God has called us to as best we can and going before him when we stumble and struggle and fail, will be with us the entire way. Actually, his home, the home for his spirit is inside of us the entire way. That we dwell on the right things and live out the things that we already know or the things that we have learned or the things that we see in godly people. This becomes our daily pursuit. Now, as I did last week, and I'm thinking of trying to do this each and every week, not because I'm trying to, to shame anyone, because this is something that I need to do as well. I, I want us to just take a moment and pause and just think about what my daily pursuit of Christ is like. As a matter of fact, very practically speaking, if you were to say, uh, on a scale of one to five, right, one rarely and five always, how often do I spend time each day in prayer in God's word? What does that look like? And I remind you, this is not a point of shame. This is an invitation to come to the one who is near. I'm a one. Lord, and I'm coming to you to let you know, just freely admit, I'm a one. And I want to be a five, but what can I do to be a two? (laughs) And just work my way towards trusting you and coming to you with everything in my life. Because, like, we need water in order to rehydrate us physically, daily. I believe what Paul is trying to tell us is that we need to engage and trust and surrender our lives to Christ spiritually and live that out in the world. And for those of you who are thinking, I don't know how to take a next step in doing that, Please know that I'm going to pray for you in just a minute. Not like my prayer solves our problems, right? But it's asking God to help us. I also want want to help you to know that, that what I think would be good for us based on what Paul is telling us is that we be people that just begin to praise daily. What has God done that we can be thankful for? Realize that we're well off. Pray daily. Just spend some time talking with God, maybe bringing your petitions to him with thanksgiving, right? And read daily. Open up God's word or, or, or listen to God's word from an app or something like that just so you can begin to or continue to have God's word be a part of your life each and every day. And what I invite us to all do this week is to go through this book together that some people in our church have put together. It's really, really just a simple way of looking at God's word each and every day some things to think about, and then just some space for you to write your prayer out or bullet point it, because that's what I do. Just bullet point some things that you uh, are thinking about in prayer. And for one week, let's just be a, a, a group of believers that are focusing in on the same areas of God's word each and every day that will help us to learn more about being content in a simple life of Christ. And May we be people that understand that this is something that we would be best for us to be doing each and every day. Lord, would you please help us to hear the challenging words from Scripture and just accept where we are. Many of us have taken some time to just honestly consider where we are at right now, Let's just accept it and go before God and say, God, this is where I'm at. I'm a one or a three or a four or whatever it is, God. This is where I'm at. And today, right now, I choose to give myself to you. I know you're near, Lord. 
I invite you in to, to not just be a part of my life, but the thing that I pursue each and every day. Help me in this moment, God, to give that over to you. And Lord, as we are all people that will be thinking throughout this week on, on what it means to have this daily pursuit to you, God, that's my hope and my prayer that we would be people that each and every day begin to think about or invest in our time with you. And that we begin to see that we are people who are well off because of you and you alone. So God, take us where we are and move us towards where you want us to be. And then help us, God, to live out the life that you call us to. This life that seems so challenging but is yet so simple. May we with contentment live for you daily. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching this week's message. We hope you found it both encouraging and helpful. If you did, please click the like button and share with your friends. If you want to hear when new messages are posted, please subscribe to the Benton Church. We also invite you to join us on site for worship. We're located in Benton, Kansas, just east of Wichita. Our Sunday services start at 1030 and our doors are open to everyone. For more information, please check out our website at thebittenchurch.org. What do you know about God? He loves us. He died for our sins. He helps us. He's powerful. And he loves you.